Hello, hello. We are here to talk about getting started in student housing. It's such a thrill to be able to introduce you to our guests, but before I get to the good stuff, let me explain a little bit about who I am. My name is Krista Ruther. I am the senior content marketing writer here at Turbo Tenant, and I am a residential researcher. So inherently what I do is I deep dive into topics that you guys find interesting. I compile my findings, I bring in experts, and I teach you what I've learned. It is one of the great joys of my life. I've had the opportunity to produce over 50 hours of industry education content through these webinars alone. So suffice to say, it's not my first rodeo. I would love to hear whatever questions you have as they pop up. Someone else who is not in their first rodeo is the great Carlston Nasser. So Carlston, could you explain who you are and what you do to the people? Sure, happy to. Welcome everybody. I, uh, I invest in student housing. I found that the quality was low in Boulder where my son went to school and then I developed a thesis to raise capital. We have investors from all over the country who identified or liked the, the, the proposition of buying detached houses, aggregating ownership and management, and uh, basically standardizing them to a very professional level. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we, we have a portfolio of houses all uh, around CU Boulder for now, and we plan to expand to other campuses very soon. Wonderful. And could you tell us how long you've provided student housing and how many doors you have? We have uh, 12 properties closing on the 13th property uh, and a total of around 100 bedrooms. Um, maybe 82 doors was uh, an aspiration at one point. Uh, we have, uh, we're closing our 100 bedrooms, which is could be comparable to 82 doors because one bedroom in Boulder costs around $300,000. But um, this is this is where we are today. I've been doing this since 2019. Wonderful. Thank you so much. The other wonderful expert that we have in the mix today is Amber Kelly. Amber, could you tell people who you are, how long you've been providing student housing, and how many families you currently serve? Hello, everybody. And Nathan, I bought my first property right by UNC, too. And my husband and I bought our first house, rented out the basement, and that was our very first experience and now we have uh 24 units in port collins colorado and it's always a different mix we're off campus we're a little further away from campus so we'll have we have multi-family and so we'll have a varying amount currently right now i rent to, to four students and i do have one other family she started there as a student and now is married with three kids. So <laughs> that's an interesting, fun fact, but we, so we've been, and we've been doing this since 1995. Wow. That is fantastic. And a testament to how you both are just so successful at what you do. Um, so again, really thrilled to have them in the mix today, especially as we go over some of this critical information to help you guys get started in student housing. So the main takeaways that I'd like you to take away from this presentation really fall into three categories. I want you to understand the dependability of student housing from a data perspective. So we're going to go over some of that here shortly with some graphs and other interesting tidbits. I also want you to feel comfortable analyzing student housing markets. It's similar to analyzing other markets, but there are, of course, key metrics that you'll want to consider when you are pursuing student housing that might not pop up when you're looking at just the standard, the standard real estate investments that could be out there. And thirdly, we're going to talk about some attractive property attributes for student housing, amenities, things that students really need and want so that you can have the top house on the block and start really building up your empire the way you see fit. Without further ado, let's jump into the student housing base. As we do this, please keep in mind I am recording this session. It will be emailed out to you within two business days. So you are feel feel free to take notes as we go, but I do want you to know you will have another chance to hear everything that I'm saying and actually interact with the deck along with the links and sources that I've provided. So you don't have to, I don't know, develop carpal tunnel just by writing so fast because I talk quickly. All right, this is coming out to you. So with that, Let's talk a little bit about what student housing is when we are talking about independent investors, right? So when we consider student housing, we're really talking about 
either an alternative to on-campus housing or providing an option for housing if on-campus is not available. Oftentimes, universities do not provide housing for their uh, graduate students, or really, there are some schools where they only provide on-campus housing for freshmen and sophomores, but then your juniors and seniors have to go find their own place to live. So with that in mind, when we consider general broad strokes about student housing, your proximity to campus is going to be king. The closer you are to campus, the easier it is to net students, and there is a huge boon in terms of your potential ROI, the closer you get to campus. We'll go over that in more detail here shortly. Also, student housing is generally affordable. The goal is not to price gouge students. That would be... <laughs> terrible and also pretty fruitless because I don't know if you know this, but students don't always, they're not the richest people in the game, right? They are, however, way more dependable than you might think. And we'll go over some of that as well. Also, as a student housing provider, you are more likely to host groups of tenants versus individual tenants living in one unit. Um, think of your days as having roommates and, and folks who are all living together in community that is really representative of most student housing experiences, although it's not the only path forward. And of course, student housing offers students more privacy and independence than they would receive through on-campus housing. So there are a lot of different benefits for both you and the tenants as you move through student housing. Okay. You might be curious. Well, I know who students are, but what does that really look like in practice? First of all, almost 40% of all 18 to 24 year olds in the US are enrolled in some kind of post-secondary program. Um, this is important because that's a pretty healthy chunk of the population. And we have seen that enrollment rates pretty much are holding steady. We'll go into that a little bit later with the graph, but that means that you constantly have a flow of people coming into some of the most popular college towns and will help you evaluate whether or not your local colleges fall into that category. In 2023, there are also 3 million graduate students. So that is quite a healthy population as well, and definitely a group that benefits from off-campus housing, seeing as by and large universities don't have the ability to support on-campus housing for grad students. In fact, 8.6 million students actually struggled to find suitable housing close to their university that was both affordable and something that they would want to live in. So there is a huge opportunity in this niche if you set yourself up for success using the tips that we will offer you today. With this, let's get into some of those student housing statistics. First and foremost, there is an expectation when you are a student that you are going to be paying to live, sometimes for the very first time in that person's life. And the average cost of a student's room and board is just under $10,000 per academic year at public universities. That cost increases to over $11,000 per academic year at a private school. Public school is, if you're unfamiliar, something like a state school, right? Colorado State University, my alma mater, is a public school versus Colorado College, which is a private school, okay? So private schools by and large are more expensive in general. And also you'll see housing markets around those places are usually more expensive as well. When it comes to thinking about the benefits to students, um, students can actually save money and pay 15% less in rent annually if they have one roommate compared to living by themselves. That's why so often you see them in groups living together. That can be a huge win. Carlston will talk a little bit about that later. Um, and also, as I mentioned, enrollment rates are looking really healthy across the United States for various levels of post-secondary education. So we saw a growth of 2.5% in undergraduate enrollment as of this spring. During that same time period, graduate enrollment grew by 3%. And this is data coming from Booking Ninjas, National Multifamily Housing Council, and the National Student Clearinghouse Research Center, respectively, right? So in terms of enrollment rates, this is what we are looking at, and this is broken down by the type of university, which is quite fascinating. So the dark blue here is going to be the public four-year college. And then most of the labels are pretty self-explanatory, except PAB. A PAB is a primarily associate degree granting baccalaureate institution. So it means that those are places that people go to get a two-year degree by and large. 
Okay. So you can see here, though there was a bit of a dip in 2022, we are rising with our public paths. Um, and also you can see things are just really holding steady, which is a great sign for investors because that means you're going to have people constantly filtering in needing somewhere to live. All right. As a fun little quiz here, I'm curious if you want to take a guess at what the total of all student housing transactions was in 2022. This is just a quick poll that we have. And I'm curious to see if you guys can get the right answer here. Oh, maybe it's disappeared. Feel free to drop it in the chat. I will take a quick look. Oh, there we go. Hey, we got it. We got it. Um, so take a guess. What do you think the total of all student housing transactions was in 2022? All right. I see some questions in the chat. Um, doo -doo -doo. Our units, bedrooms, or full apartments? Emilio, typically I'm talking about bedrooms in this case for student housing, but that's a really good question. All right, 10 more seconds. I'll let you filter in, click some buttons if you're interested in answering what you think the total of all student housing transactions in 2022 is. Uh, just a bit of a fun question to show you what kind of opportunities lie in this niche. All right. So only about 23% of you got it right. In 2022, there were actually 22.9 billion, and that's with a B, billion dollars of student housing transactions. Um, and that number is expected to continue increasing. So this is a great time to get involved and to find a spot that you can leverage for years to come. Right? Next up here, you might be thinking, well, why student housing specifically? There are a lot of great reasons for why student housing. First and foremost, as I've mentioned, universities are not often able to offer on-campus housing to all of their students, let alone all of their undergraduates, right? Um, in fact, the top 175 universities could only house about 22% of their undergraduates on campus. However, as we've said before, everyone needs somewhere to live, which means if you are providing a high quality spot that's close by campus or near a public transportation line, you could have a really popular, fruitful rental that lasts for a long time. Also, the number of college students is projected to reach 19.25 million this year in 2024. Again, pretty healthy chunk of the population, and it is what we would refer to as a captive tenant pool. Now, please don't take that the wrong way. We are not capturing students. That is not what this is about. But instead, we just recognize that there is a need because these folks are coming into school. Most of them are going to be traveling in and wanting to live nearby campus. So you could be the housing provider of their dreams if you just get into that spot. According to Burkadia, the average price per student housing unit is $251,000. Okay, that's a healthy chunk as well. In that vein, we see that student housing rent has actually increased 6% according to the latest figures year over year. So that's 2022 to 2023. We expect that to continue increasing. And the average monthly rent per bed is $895 during that same time period. I'm curious, Carlston and Amber, I know that you had different reasons for getting into student housing. Now that you've been doing it for a while, what is your why when it comes to why you're involved in student housing? Go ahead, Amber. Well, um, uh, first of all, I think it's just, it's just such a wonderful thing to have a college in your community because they contribute to, like when you go through economic hard times, having a college really stabilizes the economy and they really provide diversity. Um, they'll give you lots of notice, you know, like they're planning for the next year in May. So you get lots of notice to be ready for turnovers. They're very, um, in my experience, they've been very easy to work with and they're very wanting to learn and know, and you have a great opportunity to really positively influence their lives. Beautifully said. Carlson, yeah. anything that you would add? Yeah, in my, in my case, is I identified a market by, purely by coincidence that uh, the quality was really low and prices were really high. 
I thought that I could make a difference very quickly by just supplying better quality. Even if I had to charge slightly higher rent, the market was there, the demand was there. So when I see the uh, happiness and satisfaction in the faces of parents when they move to their kids to my houses, and most parents come here to help their kids move in and out, uh, is, uh, uh, you know, gives me a sense of pleasure. Uh, the money is there, but supplying quality and safe housing where it was uh, hard to find, uh, at least in 2016 when my son went to school, is something that gives me a lot of fulfillment. I love that. It's a lot of community building and you're still profiting, you're still investors, but you really have a chance to get involved in a student's success story. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Thank you both. In terms of that investing piece, something you all might be curious about is just how student rent has grown over you know, the past few years. So we have this nice graph here. It is from Yardi, and you can tell so the orange marker is fall 2024, um, and you can see some of those figures. We are at a really healthy growth rate. It is not quite as high as last year, but that means that there is room to continue increasing. It has not dropped so far down that it is a concern. In fact, this continues to be one of the healthiest niches that I've seen as I've done this research. And well worth considering because, again, you, you if you get a spot and you stay there for a while and it has either good public transport or you're really close to campus, you are going to be in demand. And that is a really wonderful spot to be in as an investor, as I'm sure you guys are aware. However, we do want to give you a realistic picture of what to expect from student housing. So let's talk about some of the downsides and the benefits, starting with, of course, those cons. Now, we also talk about this in our student housing course. You'll hear me talk about that a little bit later. But these are the top cons that you might consider if you are trying to get into student housing. First and foremost, first-time tenants are going to require more patience. Oftentimes, when students are looking for housing, it might be their very first time living by themselves. Or it's possible that they went, they lived on campus for the allotted time that they could, but now you are their first real landlord who's not attached to their school. That doesn't make them bad tenants. It just means that you should really hold their hand a little bit without taking away their agency as an adult and make sure that they understand how to get a hold of you, when to get a hold of you, what situations are emergencies and which ones are not. Um, it is critical that you are empathetic and you are working with them. Now, that doesn't mean that be their best friend. In fact, I advise against that. But it does mean, you know, if they come to you with something that you know isn't an emergency, but in their head it is like a mountain, you want to talk to them respectfully and just let them know, hey, I understand it's really uh, concerning. If you don't know where the water shutoff is, let me make sure that you know that. So in the future, this is not a, a five alarm fire. You can just understand this is exactly where it is. X, Y, Z. So definitely mitigatable with some information, compassion, and education, but that is something to keep in mind. Also, new colleges don't pop up very often, so they are pretty well established where they are located. And that means that, you know, if you're hoping that maybe a college will pop up just down the road from you, it's, it's fairly unlikely that that's going to happen. You should look at established schools and see where you can get into their housing markets versus keeping your fingers crossed, especially because there just simply aren't a lot of new universities coming up nowadays. And thirdly, institutional investors are very much interested in the student housing game. In fact, Blackstone acquired American Campus Communities, which is the nation's largest student housing developer, for $13 billion in August of 2022. With that in mind, there is still room for you, right? Like these investing inst like these in institutional investors are certainly going to try and get their slice of the pie. But a lot of the times there are really negative connotations for tenants looking for housing who see one of these big groups and they don't necessarily want to partake. Um, there's this sense of disconnection. They don't know the landlord. They're, it's very corporate. They won't get their needs met, which means if you come in and you are empathetic and you have a rental, you're just going out there and doing it yourself, they are more likely to find you and want to be involved with you versus an institutional investor who feels kind of like an ominous black cloud that they'll never actually meet. 
course, it's not all doom and gloom when we think about student housing. There are plenty of benefits as well. I've isolated it to just the top three, but again, we go into more detail in our course. So first and foremost, student student tenants are really looking for affordability, right? They don't care necessarily about having the flashiest amenities, steel countertops, steel countertops, <laughs> granite countertops, steel appliances. That is not their driving factor. Their driving factor is by and large proximity to their school and affordability. Can they actually make the rent? That's why they often rent in groups because it, it lessens the financial burden on all of them when they come together. That also means that you can find a property and of course we want it to be as nice as possible. You want it to be somewhere comfortable for your tenants to live, but you don't have to gut a, a property completely, put in the newest, latest stuff and charge a premium for it. That is less likely to succeed depending on where you are and which colleges you're nearby. In fact, if you just have kind of a humble spot with all of the things that they need to live, you are going to be in a really good area to succeed with student housing. Additionally, um, something unique with student housing is the ability to charge by the bed. Now, you can do that in other types of real estate investments, but student tenants are particularly aligned with this concept because, again, they're looking for that affordable aspect. They know that living with people makes it more affordable to stay in a rental. So you have the, the option to charge by the bed and make more per housing unit, right? So now I'm talking about the entire property than you would have if you just rented to a single family. Lastly, and we've hit on this a couple times, students will always need housing. There are always going to be a trickle of students coming in, which means if you set yourself up for success, you have an active tenant pool who will always keep coming back. If in fact you go above and beyond, you're empathetic, you're warm, you make connections with your tenants, you will be surprised at how much word of mouth marketing works in your favor. Because if you've been a really good landlord, your student, you know, it's time for them to move on. Maybe they're graduating. If they have friends that are also looking for housing, there's a great possibility that they will come to you and say, hey, I know how wonderful Amber was. You should go apply for her property. And that brings in someone who could also be a really wonderful tenant. All right. So now that we've gotten kind of the lay of the land when it comes to student housing, we're going to jump into analyzing student housing markets. But I'm going to take a quick check here at the chat and at the q and I know Carlston is just grinding away with some great answers in here. Thank you for doing that. So first, I see a question from Althea about uh, identifying grad students are preferred in your listing. So could you do it? Eh, I mean... Student classification is not a protected class. However, you could be seen as violating the Fair Housing Act because you're specifically saying students and you're kind of doing it based on family, which family is a protected class, um, family classification. So I would not advertise that you only want grad students or that you prefer grad students. You can make that known in terms of the amenities that you list, your proximity to campus. That's another big one. Um, but you should not specify that in your listing. Okay. How have you found the units for student housing? Carlston is typing an answer. We also talk about that a little bit here and in our course as well. Mo, Mo, I think I saw an email from you earlier today about this very topic. I sent you an article about how to handle international students who have no credit. Um, there are quite a few things that you can do. Amber, I know that this is an area of expertise for you. You've certainly housed many international students. Could you give us a brief primer on how you handle international students who have no credit? Sure. Um, I think that the best thing to do is get in touch with their, they usually have a sponsor. If they're, if they're in the college in a program, the amount of the verifications and screening they've already had to do to get in that program, even if they won't tell you about that particular student for whatever reason, they can tell you what qualifications it's taken to get into that program. That's really helpful. Um, I've had students give me, I've called their teachers in different areas and they've given me personal recommendations. They're there's a lot of ways if you're willing to just ask them to give you some references. Um, and there, but it, it, you do have to be creative and a ask them what they can, I mean, I mean, and maybe you can help me with that, Krista, what, what you're allowed to ask to provide. But I think 
the number, the first place I would start is to, um, they'll tell you what program they're in and get in touch with their, the person that runs that program. And they'll have some advice for you about where to go from there. Yes, very true. So definitely get in touch with their sponsor, as Amber said. Additionally, you can ask for certain kinds of reports, like a creditor letter, um, basically something from their home country that speaks to their credit worthiness. That is uh, pretty much, it's similar to getting a reference letter, but it's it's a little bit more exact. This might come from their bank. This might come from their former employer back in their home country. But there are ways that you can get this information without having the same uh, set of documentation that you would have for someone who has a social security number. So it's all about getting creative. Lexi, if you get the chance, there is an article that we have about international screening and international um, tenants. If you could drop that in the chat, I would very much appreciate it. So we will see if Lexi can get that over. All right, great questions. We're gonna continue moving on and we'll come back and answer them. So continue throwing those questions our way. We really appreciate them. But for now, I have a quick question for you. How comfortable are you at when it comes to analyzing rental markets? What is your level of comfort with analyzing different markets? There is no wrong answer. This is anonymous. So please don't worry if you're very uncomfortable. I want to know it. This is pretty important stuff. Give you about ooh, 40 seconds before we jump into it. Now, Carlston, you are someone who really enjoys analyzing markets from all that I can tell. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Have you always been this way? Like, have you always been analytical, especially when it comes to your investments? Yes. Uh, before starting in student housing, I was looking at uh, some global real estate markets, uh, India, Brazil, Mexico. And my job at my previous employer was exactly to do research and find markets that were mispriced or markets that had a lot of upside. Wow. So yes, it's, been my, it's in my DNA. It's in your DNA. I love to hear it. That is fantastic. And it looks like we have quite the spread in terms of who is comfortable with what. Almost a little bell graph here. We certainly have ooh, about 30% of you who are uncomfortable to some degree, and then 30% who are about neutral. And that's really great to see that around 30% of you are comfortable to some degree. That is all great. Whether you are just starting out and you're feeling very uncomfortable, not sure what to do, or you've been doing this for a while and you're like, oh, market analysis, I'm like Carlston, it's in my DNA. We have got some tips and tricks to share with you, specifically as they relate to student housing. So when we are looking at different markets for student housing opportunities, there are quite a few things that I want you to keep in mind. First and foremost, if you can start locally, we would recommend it. Why? Few reasons. One, when you are local, it's really easy to just casually drive by, just do a visual check on the property, and that can give you not only peace of mind, but it offers an opportunity to step in and have a formal inspection sooner than you would normally have one if you see things are starting to kind of get funky. Additionally, when you're starting locally, you probably have a better idea of the market than you might even expect from yourself because it's in your backyard. And that can be a real advantage, especially when you're trying to figure out which property is going to work best for these students. As you are examining that market, I want you to consider the following points. Which colleges are nearby? If you have a situation where you can have one property that is really close to multiple universities, that's incredible. That is something to really highly consider as you move through and decide where to put your next investment. I also want you to look up when the market reaches 100% occupancy and the pre-leasing velocity. Okay, so depending on where you are in the country and how popular the universities near you are, you can see this 100% occupancy rate hit even before fall. Um, we have some statistics on the next slide. We have some data on the next slide that kind of goes over some of this and shows you some of the top performing market by pre-leasing velocity. But it's just something that's really important to keep in mind. 100% occupancy means everybody's sealed up. They are good to go. So you just want to understand when the ebbs and flows of your local market is so that you can um, make sure that you're marketing your property appropriately and that there's room for you in that market. Similarly, I want you to consider the local cap rate. Okay, The average student housing cap rate is 6%. 
according to Barkadia, but there is some uh, there are some nuances with that. I would say, first of all, if you're unfamiliar with cap rate, anything that's under 5% is typically a safe bet. If it's over 7%, it's a bit of a risky bet. Okay. So keep this in mind, tend to range around 4 to 10%, but remember, under 5, safe. Above 5, riskier. So a stable market should have stable cap rates, and that's something that you can take a look at. There is some context needed with that 6% figure for student housing cap rate. Um, according to Brigadia's report, there was a significant lack of high quality core student housing transactions in 2023. And core assets demand the most aggressive cap rates due to the extremely low risk profile of these assets. So the combination of the lack of core trades and many sales resulting from capital events like debt maturities, interest rate cap reserves, and some of the impacts of floating rate debt on some owners could artificially elevate those student housing cap rates. So with that in mind, the prevailing cap rate is 5.5%, plus or minus 10 basis points. All of this is to say, it's still a smart and healthy investment, but I do want you to make sure that you are looking at what's going on in your local market. Additionally, I want you to consider rent growth over enrollment size at the university. Why is that? Well, because you're investors and because I want, if you're going in there looking to make money and continue earning money over time, it's going to be more critical to understand how rents have increased versus what the enrollment numbers are doing. Don't disregard enrollment. I think it's still important to keep in mind, but prioritize rent growth over enrollment size. You're also going to make sure to look at vacancy rates. That'll be critical. Um, an oversaturated market is no fun for any investor, and you want to make sure that there is a healthy spot for you to jump in and offer your property, right? So take a look at those vacancy rates, along with average rent in the area. You'll also want to understand the number of beds completed or under construction. Um, this will give you a sense of what's coming next in the landscape. If there are a tidal wave of beds coming in, that might inform your strategy differently than if there are not very many beds getting built up nowadays, right? Because that means that there's more opportunity for you. And lastly, of course, consider the available property types in your local market for student housing. We're going to go over the differences and the pros and cons with single family versus multifamily for student housing in a little bit. But I just want you to keep that in mind as you look at different markets and start to decide where you want to go. All right. As promised, let's take a quick look at the top 10 universities by pre-leasing percentage. Now, something to keep in mind, and this is actually a note from the brilliant Carlston, um, this data is coming from a big aggregator in the space that typically uses institutional real estate solely. So this is really coming from some of those big players which means it's a good indicator, but it might not be a one-to-one -one with what you would see in the shadow market, which is what uh, Carlston invests in in Boulder, right? So this means that you will have more opportunities and you can lean on this data as a, a beacon for what's to come, how things are performing, but make sure that you're doing your due diligence as well. What we see here is that Purdue is leading the charge in terms of pre-leasing rates. In February 2024, they were nearly at 92% pre-leased, um, which is pretty impressive, right? Because the school year doesn't typically start until the fall. So folks are really getting ahead and trying to make sure that they have their housing down pat. That is another benefit of students is that typically they have to plan out quite a bit more in advance than your average tenant because they have classes to attend to, activities, et cetera. So they typically know what they're going to do and that allows you to plan accordingly as well. I'll give you a second to look at this. One of the biggest surprises for me personally was this University of Missouri getting on the map. I didn't expect them to have such a high and healthy pre-leasing rate. Nothing against Missouri. I was just surprised to see them there. But this is one of those uh, breakdowns that I think is really worthwhile for investors to consider, whether you've been doing this for a while or this is going to be your first investment. This data is readily available out in the world. I'm also going to give you some resources at the end of this presentation that are free to use, and you can basically build this table yourself for your local market. All right. So we've talked about how to analyze the market, things to look for. Now let's consider the college as well. This advice comes from the COO 
of campus apartments, says the institutional investor group that Blackstone purchased. Um, and they recommend investing in your universities with at least 20,000 students in a strong athletic program, somewhere with a thriving international student program. That could be a huge boon. And of course, a school with both with all of the above, including undergraduate, graduate, and PhD offerings. Why is this? Well, all of these different aspects here mean that people are actively coming into the school. A big, diverse population is coming, and it is holding strong, right? Because they are anchored with their athletic program. Having a thriving international student program means always having folks coming in there as well. And when you get beyond offering just undergraduate degrees, you get folks who have maybe uh, maybe not as much money, but they are really looking to stay and plant while they finish out their graduate or PhD program, which is really worthwhile. Now, I know there was a question in the chat about location and how far is too far. There is data around this. So first and foremost, one of the best ways to net student tenants specifically is to have a property as close as possible to campus. Or, like Amber, have properties that are right against really reliable public transportation. If your student can just easily hop on a bus and be to campus within however long it takes, 10 to 15 to 20 minutes, that is going to be a huge win for them and for you. What we see here from research.com, um, you really want to make sure, if it's possible, to get as close to campus as you can, mostly because you will see a higher... Uh, higher chance for better revenue, right? So rentals within a half mile of campus have the highest national price per bed at $131,244. And you can see the further you get from campus, the more that that figure drops down. When we look at this in terms of pre-leasing, you will also see similar figures where the closer it is to campus, the higher the pre-leasing rate, farther it is from campus, the lower the pre-leasing rate. Again, location is king. But if there is a reliable way for your students to get to campus and back and it's really close by, that means you're still in the game as well. So really consider that public transportation aspect as you look at potential properties. When it comes to looking at those potential properties, there are quite a few things to consider. But let's tackle the question of single family versus multifamily. There are pros and cons to each, and I want to be clear off the bat, there's not a wrong way to approach student housing in terms of the property type that you choose. It's just important to understand some of the potential implications and potential drawbacks that each one offers. So starting with single family, of course, people really enjoy having more privacy. And if there is an opportunity to have a front or backyard, dedicated parking, and no shared walls with strangers, folks are often willing to pay a premium, even when they're students, for that kind of level of privacy. Also, single family homes don't compete head to head with institutional investors. Institutional investors are usually looking at multifamily, which we'll get into here in a bit. Additionally, it's usually easier to remodel or add more rooms to a single family home because it has more space by and large and fewer of those common areas that are taking up some of that space. That means that you could generate another $500 to $800 per month in additional rental income with an extra bedroom. There are, of course, some cons as well. Uh, your single family home could become the gathering spot, could become the party house. Now, that's not always a bad thing if you're prepared, um, but it is something to keep in mind. Also, you need to be crystal clear regarding your expectations for upkeep, lawn care, snow removal, etc., because again, these are some first time renters, it might not occur to them to do it on their own. So make sure that you're really spelling this out. Now, Carlston's portfolio is largely, if not only single family houses, and you actually capitalize on the idea of being the party house. Can you talk to us a little bit about how that's worked out for you and your general approach with single family housing for suits? Yeah, uh, that, that, uh, the points you uh, mentioned, Krista, are spot on. It's true. We have many roofs. We have many HVAC systems. We have lawns in the front and the back of the houses, and we have crews running around all of these places. But with time, when you standardize the finishes, countertops, appliances, everything, uh, it becomes easier. Uh, the, the advantage, going back to your question, the, the advantages of having the house and having a house as a um, uh, a place that has a character has worked out for me. 
has worked out in Boulder because there is a typical uh, student that is in a way self-selecting uh, that comes to Boulder. They they like to nickname the houses. They like to, when they, when they have a party, they don't say, this is the address of the party. They just say, this is in X, Y, and Z house. So uh, it becomes um, a very desirable place to live. So my houses, they pre-lease every year in two or three weeks, starting on October 15th, because they are desirable. And there, there, there will be parties, whether you rule them out or not. Uh, it's, it's just a, a question of, are you prepared? Are your walls prepared? Are your floors prepared to have higher traffic? And, uh, or in, my, in one of my houses, are, uh, is the ceiling prepared to have a dance pool? So it's, uh, it, it's part of the game, I think. <laughs> part of the game, indeed. And it sounds like your house is like the place I would want to live in if I was a student again. <laughs> that sounds very fun. Thank you for that. Another great opportunity is, of course, in multifamily housing, right? So when we take a look at multifamily housing, there are so many benefits if you can nab one of those properties up. For example, there are typically more common areas. Uh, you know, maybe it is a lobby or a little shared kitchen that they can all gather in downstairs. Um, this helps to foster a sense of community, which can have long lasting positive implications. Also, multifamily properties can typically house more tenants, which means that you are collecting more rent each month and can lead to a really great, healthy rental revenue over time. And of course, with a multifamily property, you only have one yard and one utility set up to worry about one HVAC per property. And that can really reduce the amount of admin work and also maintenance issues because it's all concentrated in one spot for that group. Okay. There are some drawbacks too. For example, noise complaints can become common depending on who else you have in your multifamily property. If it's a mixed property where there are some regular tenants and some student tenants, you want to make sure that your students understand when quiet hours are and really abide by those so that they don't uh, violate the warranty of habitability for your other tenants. Also, in terms of finding these properties, they can be more expensive and less available than single family homes on average, especially because you are competing with institutional investors more in the multifamily space. And lastly here, they historically appreciate less than single family homes, which is something to keep in mind if you are looking to sell off your portfolio down the line. Now, one of the best parts beyond just how wonderful they are as people between Amber and Carlston is just that they have very different approaches to how they handle student housing. So Amber, you have multifamily housing and it has a mix of different types of tenants. Could you speak a little to that and how that's worked out? Um, it's, I think it's worked out beautifully. It's, it does. I liked what you said about fostering a sense of community because that's really something I've seen. Um, it's nice to see all the generations interacting and enjoying each other, all different walks of life and we're this weekend we're having an event where we're all getting in the backyard and having pizza together. And it is nice to, um, it's nice. I, it just makes me happy. And it does sometimes when there is a sense of community, then they will, I really haven't had a lot of noise complaints to be very honest. Oh. Had students for the whole, I, I've had a multifamily property for the last 10 years and I've had maybe one complaint about students and noise. They tend to just go to Carlston's house. And sit there. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, they no. I think I think it's it's um it's nice to have the mix of people, and it's nice to have just one lawn. And snow removal is simple and inexpensive, and I have more time to spend with people and less time running around mowing lawns because our crew is really small. It's just our family that runs it. So I think um to the people asking about grad students and things like that. Um, I think any student can be, can learn to be respectful of the quiet hours and the times and your, so I would, I think they're all, it's, it's worked out very well. I love to hear that. Thank you so much. Also, how fun for your event. I, that's wonderful. Yeah. All right. So we've touched on some of the things that students want from housing regarding privacy, things of this nature, but JP Morgan took an extra look at this to really hone in on some of the top aspects that students are looking for when they are considering off-campus housing. 
first and foremost, not surprisingly, privacy <laughs> reigns supreme, right? Tenants want to have their own space, even if they have roommates. They want to feel like they have room to just be themselves, study, do whatever. And so this is the number one thing that students are looking for. Also, if you've been paying attention, proximity to campus should not surprise you. The closer that students can be to their universities, the better for them, the later they can wake up, roll out of bed, and go to an 8 a.m. philosophy class. So that is something that is going to be highly considered as they are looking for somewhere to live. They are also looking for someone who is going to be a responsive housing provider. Again, this touches back on the fact that many of these renters do not have a lot of experience being in the real world um, and doing things on their own. So they want to make sure that they are working with someone who's going to take their requests seriously and also give them the information that they need in a timely way and address their concerns accordingly. Also, Wi-Fi has become a critical feature in our society at large. It enables me to do this job right now. Um, and that means that students are looking for it too. So this does not mean that you have to offer it. In fact, it could be really tricky to offer it for a variety of reasons. But just know that this is something that students are going to be looking for and really keeping top of mind as they move through their coursework. And lastly, if you have a single family residence, then having in-unit laundry is going to set you apart. It's really a must have. They are not looking to, you know, traipse their laundry all around town to get it done. It's possible that might have to be the situation, but if you are able to provide in-unit laundry, that is really going to be a great distinguishing factor for you and seal the deal for many of your student tenants. I know that there have been some questions in the chat about occupancy limits. Um, first and foremost, always make sure you check your local occupancy laws. It used to be, it is no longer this way, but it used to be in Colorado, Fort Collins specifically, there was the U plus two rule. This was in place back when I was a student 10,000 years ago. Inherently, it meant that as a tenant, I could only live with two other people who were not related to me. So even if I was looking at a house that had five bedrooms, two baths, I was unable to live with anyone except two others who were not related to me. Jared Polis has signed into law a measure that has now changed that, right? It is no longer the U plus two rule. But I do just want to make sure that you are looking up your local laws to make sure that you are staying compliant. With that said, by and large, what we see is the idea that you can have three tenants or fewer per bathroom. Again, make sure that that aligns with your local laws. But if you are looking at a property and trying to figure out how many people can fit within it, that is by and large a good rule of thumb to go to. When we consider the rest of the landscape and different amenities that folks are looking for, here is what shakes out. Again, Wi-Fi and laundry take the top two spots on the list. Um, having utilities included, it's always nice. Students might be looking for it. In fact, they are in bulk. That's the third highest. And then, of course, we get into some of the more uh, nuanced, more institutional level aspects of housing, right? So you do not have to provide a clubhouse. Um, you can go above and beyond like Amber and provide a resident event. That's wonderful. But don't feel like you have to build on a separate clubhouse just because it's on this graph. This largely is what folks are looking for, these top five. And so that is what I would consider if I was looking for a property in a student housing market. All right. Now we're going to get into how you actually become a student housing provider. We are close on time, so I'm going to save the questions and just roll right through, and then we'll hit all your questions. But first and foremost, we've talked about how to analyze a market. We've talked about the different types of metrics you need to pull. Here's where you can get that information. Excuse me. So again, this deck will be emailed out to you. These are all linked so that you can click on them and use them to your heart's content. Please do. I think they'll really help you find a great deal. First and foremost is the rental property calculator. This will help you understand your potential ROI, which is um, your return on investment, in addition to your monthly vacancy loss, cap rate, et cetera. So this should give you a good projection of what a property could do and how it could perform. You should also look at our rental yield calculator. This will help you understand your potential gross and net rental yields. If this is all sounding like Greek to you, don't worry. We have explanations on these pages for what these different terms mean. And there's no shame in being new. So make sure you look at that. If you're still confused, please reach out. 
Also, I've included this really handy link. This might have come from Amber or Carlston. In fact, I'm inclined to say it probably did because they're so smart. But this link is it's really cool. Inherently, you can look up any university and you can have a whole breakdown of what they're offering, the demographics of their student population, um, campus housing, if it's available, their enrollment rates, et cetera. So this will give you the insider scoop on your local universities at a glance, which is so critical. Lastly, here we have the rent estimate report. This will help you understand what people in your area are charging for comparable rentals, and it is free to use. So again, we will email this out to you. You can play with all of these tools, but this is at least a collection to get you started so that you can be just so honed in on your market that you feel really confident about the next deal you make. All right. Once you are, you have your property, you're looking for people to come live in it, um, I would encourage you to come check out TurboTenant if you're not already. About 60% of you said that you have a TurboTenant account, so to the 40% who do not, we help you with every phase of the self-management cycle, from finding your tenants, to collecting rent, to everything in between. Um, Carlston specifically called out how much he loves our e-signature process, rent tracking, and tenant messaging. Carlston, do you want to speak to any of those points and how TurboTenant has helped you with your business? Yes, um, um, I have houses that have 12 bedrooms and houses that have only three. And uh, when when it comes to signing a lease, time is of the essence and you don't want the tenant considering another house once you logged in in a preferred group. So uh, I, with a few clicks, I can have both co-signers who are the guarantors, parents, an adult with an income and the tenant sign all the documents that I send to them using the free service that TurboTenant provides. I can also get that via, you know, sending a bunch of uh, emails with attachments, but uh, TurboTenant uh, automatically files the document in that lease uh, that you are managing. So it's, it's very convenient. We love to hear it. There are so many different features that you can leverage for free to help streamline your business. And I hope you'll at least check it out if you haven't already. And lastly, before we hit all of your questions, this webinar serves as a great primer to student housing. If you are serious and you really want to get into the game, I am going to suggest that you get into our new student housing course. So Amber and Carlston are instructors alongside me and Jonathan Forche, who is the director of education here at TurboTenant. We really deep dive into finding property that aligns with your goals, how to market your property to find the best tenants, um, and also get into some of the nitty gritty regarding student tenant screening. What do you do with someone who has no credit or low credit? We teach you, we walk you through it, including all of the steps that you need to take, documentation you can request, et cetera. We also give you a wealth of resources. So this course is about two hours worth of content, which means you get to hear so much more from us Amber and Carlston were also gracious enough to share some of their real world case studies. So things that they have seen in managing their portfolios over the years. And just for you, just for my wonderful webinar guests, you can use promo code webinar. And that means that you can get this two hour course that is completely online, self-paced for just $15. If that's not an investment, I don't know what is. <laughs> so please, I will have these details for you in the follow-up email where this deck and recording will be as well. But just take a look, come learn with us. We would love to see you succeed and we're gonna give you the tools to do it. So with that in mind, let's look at the chat and see here, can realtors get CE? Unfortunately, Emilio, this is not a certified course for CE, but I appreciate that. Janine, I did say $15. So use promo code webinar. And that promo code is good for two weeks. So jump on it sooner rather than later. When the promo code is not active, it is $30. So you are saving half off, which again, that's a pretty good investment. What can I say? All right, uh, let's see, questions, questions. We've got people sharing their thoughts on multifamily versus single family. Da, 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 da. Okay, um, so open questions. Marita says, do you need to provide the apartments furnished with beds, desk, et cetera? What amenities? I'm curious, Amber and Carlston, do, how much furnishing do you provide in your rentals? I provide none. Uh, the houses are built in 1907 and there is a very lively market of used furniture here in Boulder for 
students who um, are moving to a new place. And typically, the, the people, especially if they are seniors, the people graduating and moving out of the house will sell the furniture that is already in place for, for a huge discount. So no, uh, this uh, providing furnished uh, student housing is a thing for institutional investors, the big buildings, you know, the landmarks, the American campus communities, and uh, the other big players in the space because they have cookie cutter type of units with many, many, many uh, replicate uh, rec replicated uh, uh, furniture that's well designed for them. Wonderful. And I do not, I don't provide furniture either. And I would make one note on, we actually have in our lease there in the turbo, I don't know if turbo tenant addresses bed bugs, but you do have to be careful about used furniture where we do have conversations with them about not getting them from the dumpster or their buddy. Like if they kind of know, be careful about that. And so, um, there's, that's just my note on furniture. Ah. Great notes. Great notes. All right. Let's see what else we have here. Okay. Promo code is expired. Let me take a look at that, Marcy. It should not expire because I made it <laughs> just earlier today. But also, <laughs> Stephen asked, um, are other landlords seeing a need to go to specialized insurance companies that are charging a premium to take on the risk of insuring students? Is that something you guys have seen, Carlson and Amber? No, um, the, the, it's um, maybe it's a play of words, but the insurer is not insuring the students. The insurer is insuring the house and providing liability insurance to the landlord. Um, the insurer, the, 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 the students get uh, uh, renters insurance themselves. So I you know, my houses are all 100% occupied by students and I open with my insurance broker, but I, I have not seen a, um, a markup for the premiums just because they're, the houses are occupied by students. Agreed. I think renter's insurance, I, I'm sure you have a webinar on that, that explains renter's insurance and how important that is to require it. Yeah, you know, we do, we have a, a landlord insurance webinar and I've written a couple articles about renter's insurance. So definitely we have that information out there and I would highly recommend looking into it. Um, again, it's just really important so that you can feel confident about what you're putting out there and that you and your tenants are well protected in the mix. All right, what do we have here? I've, re I've been rejected by five different insurance companies for student housing. Hi, that is wild. I'm sorry to hear that. I'm not sure why that's happening. I haven't really seen that before. But again, I might have a conversation with the insurance brokers to better understand because they they should not be able to discriminate against who you house. Because um, again, it, it's kind of nebulous, but it could fall under fair housing based on familial status. Um, again, kind of nebulous, but definitely worth discussing with your agents. Uh, okay, let's see. No other major questions. Can you send us the rent estimate link now? You know, coach, for you, sure. Let's do it. I am going to grab that here and I will drop it in the chat. You said rent estimate. Oh, Lexi did it. Lexi, you champion. Look at that. It is in the chat. Please check it out. Um, okay. Okay. Yes. Let's see. I think we have one more question. I have a three bedroom apartment available in July in Boston. Is July a good month to target students? What do you guys think? Um, I agree. I try to have all my leases, all the leases ending July 31st, because that is the time when there's the most movement in our part in, in Fort Collins. Next. Yeah, but I, I normally target mid-August, but I give at least two weeks. I always look at the date that the classes will start. So I give new uh, students moving in at least two weeks for them to get comfortable with the house. And then I take out another 10 days for turnover. So it all starts, the, 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 the fixed point is classes starting, and then I move back two weeks plus 10 days. There you go. Love it. All right. I have one more question here and then we can keep rolling. 
actually two more questions. So this first one I could take, it's pretty fast. Jacob asks, what about pets? What seems to be the best approach or policy? Um, by and large, if you allow pets, you double your rental pool, your tenant potential tenant pool, because there are so many more people with pets than there are rentals that accept pets. There are things that you can do to make sure that your property is protected against potential pet damage. But what we see by and large is that there is not really an increase in damage when you have pets in the property, right? You want to make sure that everything is written out clearly, that there are clear expectations set, especially for students with pets. Um, but you could charge a pet deposit, you could charge pet rent, you could charge a non-refundable pet fee or mix and match where you do two of those three things. We do have an ebook all about pets and also ESAs and other animals that might get into your rental. It is available for free. Um, so please do check that out. I think it's really worthwhile and not just because I wrote it. All right. Very last question here. Let's see. Oh, maybe it's been answered. I think it is. Um, by what means do students usually pay their rent? Carlston says auto pay through turbo tenant. That is so true. Students might also have parents who are paying their rent. They might have a job which is funding their rent, et cetera. So they are reliable. I would highly recommend at least checking it out. Um, Lexi, thank you for dropping all of those links. So gang, it has been so wonderful to chat with you. If you want to dive deeper into student housing, please check out our course. Again, use promo code webinar. That will give you 50% off. If it is still invalid, it shouldn't be. I just double checked. But if you're having any issues, email me directly at krista at turbotenant.com. Otherwise, Carlston, Amber, it has been downright fantastic to get to chat with you throughout this whole process. Thank you for your expertise and your wisdom. And I hope you all have a real, oh, before we go, there are some opportunities with Carlston and Amber that we need to talk about super quickly. I don't know who wants to go first. Carlston, do you want to talk about investment opportunities? Yes. Uh, uh, my business based here in Boulder is always looking for people who want to invest in Boulder, learn about Boulder. Uh, if you want to buy a house in Boulder, I can help. No cost. If you want just to invest in Boulder, um, I'm always pulling capital groups of investors who see the opportunity here and want to partner with us. So uh, feel free to reach out. Our website is fiverrproperties.com, the name of the company uh, right next to my name. And, and I look forward to talking to you. Absolutely. And, and I just wanted to uh, say that a lot of the questions that you may not, that you need answered at your local level, there's a lot of groups. The National Apartment Association has a has a group in almost every state in the United States, and it's a really good idea to get involved with them. And you can find mentors and answers to really specific questions about your area. They can help you stay up to date on the local state laws so they can make sure you're always in compliance. And it's, and it's also a stressful job. It's nice to have people to talk to. And I wanted to thank you all for providing housing. It's a very important, wonderful thing to do for your communities. It's so true. That is a lovely note to end on. Please check out uh, Carlston's business. Get in touch with your local folks with uh, Amber and NorCal. Um, we will be seeing you at our next at our next webinar at the eleventh hour. I stopped being able to talk. You guys have been wonderful. I hope you have a great day. We will email you out a presentation copy. So keep an eye on your emails. Otherwise, have a great Thursday. Bye bye.